Hello, and welcome to Midweek Connection on June 2nd. It's actually a Friday today, but uh, we're here at First Presbyterian Church, and my name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're going to do what we usually do, and that is read our daily lectionary texts for today and talk about them and see what the Lord might have for us. So let me open us up in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word to us. Let it be something that penetrates deeply into our hearts and transforms us into the people that you would have us to be. We thank you and praise you. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Today, starting with Psalm 130. <clears throat> Out to the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, his glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew scripture text today is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 22. Moses convened all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I am addressing to you today. You shall learn them and observe them diligently. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the fire. At that time, I was standing between the Lord and you to declare to you the words of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, <clears throat> I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, so that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. 
you neither shall you steal, neither shall you bear false witness against your neighbor, neither shall you covet your neighbor's wife, neither shall you desire your neighbor's house or field or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. <clears throat> And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Our gospel text today is from Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. So Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts, for what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone tries to enter it by force. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the law to be dropped. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Back to our psalm, <clears throat> Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty water shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy for all you upright in heart. And our final psalm today is Psalm 
139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. <clears throat> wow, do you, do you not feel today, Natalie, as if these are some pretty weighty words all around? All around. All around, pretty weighty words today. Hmm. Well, I wonder if we should start in Deuteronomy. Okay. Um, Deuteronomy, um, <coughs> the second, excuse me, I got a little catch. Right. The second telling of the law, basically, a reminder that Moses is giving to the people of Israel towards the end of their 40 year wanderings in the wilderness. They are about to cross over into the promised land. And Moses is reminding them of what has happened. This is uh, the fifth book of the, of the Torah, the fifth book of the law, the final book. It's a recapitulation of a lot of what has come before. And especially in verse five, here is the second telling of the Ten Commandments, the first of which would have been in Exodus. But one of the things that I find really interesting about not just the Ten Commandments themselves, but Moses' preface of telling these again, that it was with, uh, with the Lord our God, um, the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb, not with our ancestors, but with us who are here and alive today. But we know that these people here in Deuteronomy would have been the young children. Right of the original people who left uh, Egypt during the Exodus. They would have been the young children who are now grown up, who are about to go into the Promised Land. So when the original uh, Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai, it would have been probably 38 to 39 you know, years ago. And but Moses is reminding them that it was not a covenant that God made with their parents, but made with them. And by then extension, this covenant God makes with everybody that is called by, that calls on the name of the Lord. Right. That this, this, these, these commandments that are given is a covenant that God makes with all of his people to guide them in the manner in which they should be living. And 
And so when people like to say, well, under Jesus, we're no longer under the law, that is very true. We are not under the law as in the uh, adherence to the law is what saves us. We are right. under Christ. It is grace that we are saved. But the covenant of the law continues to exist in that sense of these are the ways that God's people should live. Right. Forever. Right. right. Well, and, and we've spoken to it before that, you know, love God, love neighbor. And if you do that, which is what Jesus says is the greatest commandment, all of these will then be done. Right. They fall under that. So it didn't negate or take and get rid of these. By loving others, these things will um, take care of themselves, I guess, if you will. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely right. Um, if one looks at the first four of the commandments, they're all about how do we relate to God. Well, don't have other, other gods. gods. <laughs> don't take his name in vain. Uh, don't make idols and honor the Sabbath. You know, mm -hmm. God established the pattern of rest and work and those things. These are the ways that, you know, what, what does it mean to love God? Well, it's right spelled here. out for you. Right. <clears throat> what does it mean to love your neighbor? Well, it's spelled out for you in the in the remaining commandments, you know, starting with honoring your mother and your father, and obviously no murder and no adultery and no stealing and no lying and no coveting. But really, it's like... <clears throat> I'm regularly intrigued as to how many people say, well, you know, I don't need the... I don't need the Bible to tell me how I should live, you know. I can I can live just fine without it and things. And and I frequently wonder, well, if it was so uh, if it was necessary to include in the Bible the things that we supposedly do naturally, I just don't think we do them naturally. I think right. you could look around the world and go, Yeah, they're messing up. There's a there's reason, a reason that it had to why, be said. <laughs> there's a reason why it had to be commanded. Right. Right. We needed to hear it. We needed the commandment. We needed for God to establish that covenant with us. Um, and he did it because he loved his people. You know, he, you know the preface there in, in verse 6, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. All of these things absent that first, uh, that verse 6, all of these things absent verse 6 would just be kind of irrelevant. Like, who made these covenant with us? The God who frees us from slavery. Right. Right. Um, and how do you stay out of slavery? Well, follow these commandments. Right. <laughs> it sounds so easy. Oh, my God. <laughs> it sounds so easy, but we... Uh, yeah, and then we have to keep... Reading it. <laughs> and then we have to keep reading it. Uh, like if we jump back over to Second Corinthians again, and I'm sorry I didn't stick a bookmark in there. Um, but, you know, Second Corinthians, uh, you know, the context of Second Corinthians, Paul is writing to the people in Corinth that they should not lose heart about his own imprisonment. But even his imprisonment doesn't mean he's lost his authority to teach, uh, to teach them and to guide them in what ways would be uh, better for the church to live. And again, this is one of those things where, well, if it was so obvious, why did it have to be written? But um, Paul is reminding them again about how um, that, you know, again, it's by God's mercy that we have the opportunity to even engage in ministry and pursue those good things of God and don't exalt yourself don't glorify yourself you know Paul being in prison it's hardly a earthly glorified position you know but right. in his humility he continues to minister to those people well and we've talked you know I think sometimes it's so easy when things are not going well that we think that somehow we have fallen from favor mm -hmm. or that um, you know we aren't receiving blessings somehow, or we want we aren't um, we aren't right with God, um, and yet here's Paul who is in prison, and you know it's I, I can imagine that prison in that time is not like prison now, as bad as prison is now. I think it was probably right pretty rough, and so but through all of that, 
there is still um, do not lose hope, do not lose heart. And so I, I think that's good for us to hear. And I think people need to realize even when things are difficult, that that doesn't mean that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Right, right. To maintain that uh, persistent faith, uh, even at high cost. Right. And, and again, getting back into that idea, well, if it's written in scripture, but if it was like, if it was just so easy, it would need to be written. But really it's written because it goes contrary to our human nature. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that people can't have their own morality apart from a biblical morality, but ultimately, who, who cares unless there's an actual consistency and, um, and you know, and, and an eternal consequence, really, right. because, you know, you go around the world and different cultures have different moral structures, different cultures uh, treat insiders and outsiders differently. Um, and so if every culture were, were moral in the same way, well, we just know they aren't. You know, there are clearly contradictory moral structures in place all around the world. And I think what makes uh, Christianity and, and Paul's even description of that is, is the Christian uh, baseline is to be persistent in the midst of the struggle and in the midst of the suffering. Right. And, and, that's, and that's actually okay. This is actually how God works out um, our salvation in our lives. And in fact, uh, you know, it, it can be said that when people are increasingly faithful, that even the difficulties and the persecutions can even increase. Right. You know, we look at Paul, he's about probably the most faithful, prolific author of the New Testament, uh, missionary journeys, teaching people about the love and the grace of Christ. And it did not result for him anyway in earthly glory. Right. Uh, but he continues to ask people to press on. Um, and even just like there in verse 10, always carrying in the body, in, in, in his own body, the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be visible in our mortal flesh. And it's, it's, it's kind of a conundrum. Actually, it's not kind of. It is a yes. conundrum on how in the world can our physical challenges, our worldly challenges, that they're not, not always physical, they can be, but... You know, emotional and spiritual or financial or, or uh, familial challenges or cultural challenges or just all of these difficulties that we face in life. And it's like, well, what we're doing is we're demonstrating the death of Jesus in our own lives that the life of Jesus might be exalted. You go, wow, okay. You can wrestle on that. You can chew on that for an entire life and still not right. get it right. So, yeah. Hmm. Let's go ahead and see what does... <clears throat> what does Jesus say to us there in this uh, Luke chapter 16? Um, gosh, it was about a year ago, I think, wasn't it, when, uh, when Kevin Huddleston preached on uh, chapter 16, this parable of the dishonest manager, which is what precedes this, and he mm -hmm. called it the lost, lost parable, in the sense mm -hmm. of what do, uh, how does the world respond uh, to loss within the midst of their own selves being lost. And it's just, mm -hmm. I think it was a, it was a genius uh, sermon. Uh, but Jesus here is explaining this, this chapter follows after the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the prodigal son and his brother, and then the parable of the dishonest manager. And so Jesus is in a lot of ways uh, summarizing all of these different statements in that if you are faithful with little things, then you will be entrusted with, with bigger, bigger things. things. Uh, and if you're not faithful with the little things, you can't possibly be entrusted with the bigger things. And, and in relation to these things that we're talking about, man, Paul, that seemed like a really big thing. How do you continue to be faithful in the midst of persecutions? That's not a, that's not a small question that requires a good amount of faith before you can even get to that point to be able to wrestle with it. So, right. um, but in a very practical way, I know I feel like I'm talking a whole lot, but You're in good. a very practical way, uh, 
it kind of does boil down to what, what's going on in this particular life. Uh, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, and it's kind of funny how Luke throws that out there because we always, we frequently think of, well, you know, the Pharisees were faithful and righteous and adhering to the law. Right. You know, they knew Deuteronomy uh, chapter five backwards and forwards. They knew all right. that stuff. And, and they were very righteous in that regard. But here's this little comment, the Pharisees who were lovers of money in the sense of, if I do these things, then I will be blessed on this earth. And I wonder right. if that became their motivation, at least in this particular instance, uh, but God is saying that your love of money is actually interfering with your love for God. And, right. and how true of many of us, many of us can that be? Hmm. Tough words again, right? They are tough today. They're tough today, and that's okay. Um, sometimes things seem to come a little bit easier. Sometimes things seem to come a little bit tough. Uh, but I think the consistency of God in our lives, again, is not dependent upon uh, our own understanding. Right. We want to grow in that, but he's going to be consistent with us whether we are fully understanding or not. We can always go Psalm 139, right? <laughs> right. But even, you know, even before we jump back to that, though, you know, everyone tries to enter by force. We don't have the power to do that on our own. We can't just, you know, we don't have to understand. We don't have to. It, it's always, God is always that primary actor. It always comes back to that. And it's, even when you look at the law that's offered up in Deuteronomy and, and you look at these words that Paul is saying, it's there in the Corinthians passage. Yes, we are called to do these things. We're, we can't do that on our own. We have to fall back into that relationship with God. We have to fall back on his goodness and his righteousness mm -hmm. um, because that you know, we, we aren't capable of doing that. Right. People try to do it by their own power and they're just not gonna be able to. Right. There's something new has to happen. And Jesus establishes a new kingdom on earth, a new relationship, a new pathway uh, through him, through his broken body to the Father. Uh, and it turns out it's not even the new pathway, it's always been that only pathway. Is through is through struggle, sacrifice, and, and ultimately Jesus with His death. Um, that's the only way. It's the only way to God. How easily, how easy we can get sidetracked and think about it. It's, it's our own efforts. It's our own strength. It's our own talent. It's our own whatever. Um, my own righteousness. And it's just like no, nope, right. never has been. Well, and even in that Corinthians that. Um in there and I, I don't know I'm, I'm gonna say this I'm not sure what where to go with this just that you know while we live we are always being given up to death for Jesus sake so that the life of Jesus may be visible in our mortal flesh so death is at work in us but life in you and it's it's this difficult like you said it's kind of the opposite of what we expect it's this idea that that there's death but there had to be death for Jesus to have life there had to be death for that resurrection. There has to be death to the world in order for us to live in him. The heart has to be changed. It can't stay the same. It has to be changed in order that um, that then we can come in and, and follow the law in the heart, not the letter of the law. The Pharisees mm -hmm. saying, here it is, you know, you do this, 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 and this, and you're righteous. No, it's love and so um, we have we have to die to the world in order to have that life in him I mean that's what he did and that's what we have to do as well mm -hmm. pulled you out of Psalm 139 no um, <laughs> no that's great I think and and I think even with that then the song well let's if we if we look at Psalm 130 that first one um, you know 
uh, we talk about deep words, right? You know, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. And it's just this whole, if, if, our, if our minds and our bodies and our souls, uh, our very, you know, uh, very being is focused on, on God, all of these questions, he promises to meet us there in that. But it's, it's an attitude of, of waiting, patience, submission, dependence, um, and, and ultimately hope. It's, 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 the, it's God who, who promises to be with us. And, and ultimately, I think, it's not that riches are bad things. They can, they can interfere sometimes, often can interfere, but in and of themselves, they're not bad. Um, it's not even health that uh, is a bad thing because we, we enjoy good health, but right. it can become too much of an obsession and get in the way. It's, it's not fame, it's not power, it's not, it's not beauty. Um, it's not any of those things, but ultimately, which can be and are good gifts that God gives, but ultimately it's God himself, God alone, that will ultimately satisfy. And I think sometimes we learn that lesson as God maybe removes some of those other things from us mm -hmm. and allows us to experience the joy of being with him. Um, you know, again, to go back to Deuteronomy, Moses knows that he's not going to enter the Promised Land. Moses right. knows that he's not going to cross over the Jordan and go with the people. Moses goes up on the mountain and he's able to see it. Uh, but, but Moses doesn't put up a big fight about that. He knows that he's going to be in the presence of God and that's, that's enough. Well, as we all go through our journey of faith and as we are all discovering and, uh, and sometimes being clouded in mystery, what, what does it mean to, to have that kind of a relationship with God? And sometimes I think we catch a glimpse of it and it kind of fades away for a second. We could catch a glimpse again. But as we are all somewhere along that journey, I wouldn't say that any of us are, you know, where Moses was even, right. you know, but, but we have that opportunity and that's what we are being invited into. And so as we go through our journeys of faith, as we are getting to that place where God is enough for us, um, if you're not there yet, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged that Jesus knows who we are. He knows who you are. And he wants to walk alongside you in the midst of that journey. In fact, uh, if he is the the end, he is the journey and the end. It's not just something at the end. He's all along with us on the journey. Um, the more you experience that, uh, well, even in the midst of not fully understanding that or even not fully experiencing that, just continue to trust and believe that Jesus loves you, that he does want what is best for you ultimately, which is himself and uh, learn to grow in that faith. And if you've got uh, concerns or questions, we're happy to listen to you and, and pray for you. But thanks for joining us today. And uh, I don't even know if this will even be posted this week. It might even have to wait until next, next week, week. because uh, Tina's out of town. But, uh, but thanks, Natalie, for reading these texts today and wrestling yeah. with these tough stuff. You want to say a prayer for us? I'd be us? happy to. Great. Gracious Lord, thank you for these words to us today. Thank you that you do walk with us and that you do know every part of us and that um, you did create us and you've known us from that moment. Thank you that you invite us into that relationship with you and that you invite us to walk with you and even in the difficulties, um, know our hearts and encourage us and be with us in a way that we feel that presence. And I pray that in those difficult moments um, that we can rest in you, that we can look to you, that we can have hope that we may be um, being transformed into what you would have us to be uh, wherever we are on that walk with you. And in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a blessed day. Take care.